met before. Have we met before? In person? No, you know, there's there was one time. It was at a concert at the Greek. Oh, I don't know. Was it, it Hall was and some, Oats? No. Yes, yes. That's because that's that the only a, time I've been to the Greek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you, you were like, I remember you and like maybe a couple of friends or yeah. your husband, boyfriend, man person in your life yep. may have been there. I remember seeing you guys by, and you guys were like having the best time. We were having the best time. That's as close as I think I've come to, oh, that's <laughs> to so physically funny. meeting you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Going crazy. Hey! Hey! Hi! Sorry about that. How many dogs do you have? I have have two. two, They sound like a lot more. It's two big pit bulls. So they got a lot of noise. Yeah. I, well, I love animals. But I have trouble because we travel. I don't know. There's guilt. My mom raised me on guilt. Yeah. She's like an agnostic, but... She still raised me with a ton of guilt. That's interesting. So it felt like it wasn't rooted in something except for like some kind of human decency bond that maybe we all hopefully share to some degree. Were you raised with religion? You know, I was, I remember being born and raised in Kentucky. Um, It's obviously a very religious place in many parts. My mom was raised Pentecostal. So she would literally go to church with her grandma who would speak in tongues and they would have snakes. Amazing. So that did not get passed down to me. I remember when I was a kid, we used to go to church some on Sundays. And then there was a time we went and it was like in a poor kind of part of the state. And like they were passing around a bowl collecting money from the people. And they were saying like, you know, I heard God tell me that we need a, a new organ for this uh, for this church, the church organ. So please. And these are people that, like, you know, couldn't put food on the table barely and sometimes. And they were because it was the voice of God that had said this. They would, you know, put their money over. And after that, my mom was like, we're not going back. So, oh, so wow. that was kind of that was sort of the end. of Wow. That. I think she was doing it as like a formality and more of a social kind of standard. Right. than It was about like instilling the spirit of God in us. So to speak. Right. But yeah, so I, I I was happy that she saw that for what that was in that in that specific moment. It's so smart to raise a child with critical thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so how are you doing though with quarantining? How are you feeling? I mean, it's day to day. Uh, you know, some days you wake up and you sort of think about everything that's happening and and how crazy it all is. And you can kind of go down a rabbit hole. But honestly, for the most part, thank God my, my girlfriend's here with me. So I have someone. Oh, good. But we're, you know, we're staying, we're staying sane. We're staying healthy. We're painting a lot, which I never do. And um, trying to be creative as possible. But it's weird because I don't feel it a lot. Like I want to write. And I have all these ideas that I've been like working on over the years. And I'm like, oh, I'm quarantined. Great time to like do all this. Yeah. But I'm just like, I'm not. It's very frustrating, that element, for sure. Oh, Josh, it's the oddest thing. Uh, this is the fourth podcast we've done like this, mm-hmm. and it's been great, but I'm oddly exhausted all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can't tell if it's like exhaustion out of some undercurrent of anxiety that I'm not really registering. And then there's also the guilt of feeling very fortunate because we are, we're so, you know. Extremely. I know that I'm inadvertently guilty of complaining about shit that I should never complain about. And so I I kind of want to think about those elements and how social media sort of relates. I think in the last decade, it's felt like actors, and you've been acting since you were a kid, so you probably, you have an insight maybe to this, that there used to be, you know, sort of the degree of separation that the mystique of like celebrity, you know, because you would see mm-hmm. celebrities on talk shows or in movies or whatever or magazines, but that was that was limited to to those elements that are highly controlled. And with social media, there's the perception of easy access, I think, too, and additional scrutiny. I know there's definitely been some Instagram stuff or Twitter stuff that I've done, and I know my management <laughs> is like, uh, you need to do <laughs> that right now. Yeah, you know, I uh, I think that. The, the access and the, the, what's the right word for it? It's something about the fact that people expect that now from a lot of, you know, people in the public eye, they expect this kind of access. And then also people who can give that access, they, they use it in a way to like posture in a way to like give this idea of, you know, it's, it's, it, it feels, it feels very inauthentic to me. And, and that's something that I've always struggled with, with social media and the pressure that that puts on everyone on, you know, a teenage girl in the middle of Ohio, who's looking at these Instagram posts of this girl, who's like the most beautiful and posting all of this kinds of things. And it's like, 
But that's also not real. It's a representation. It's a performance. It's very like performative. And for me, it kind of, it, it messes with my head and like the morality of what it means for us and the, what it could mean for us socially and the implications are, are massive. And there are the like unforeseen consequences of having that much access. But I do think that now more than ever, it is like, if you are a person, in the public eye, you are expected to, and you do many times put so much of yourself out into the world. And I, I think that that's a, a dangerous thing for a lot, a lot of reasons. It's a very weird, weird thing. Completely. What are some of your pet peeves with actors like on set? For me, it's um, when I go to set, I don't take my phone at all. And like, oh, I definitely don't have so it in a smart. scene. And and I leave it in the like the holding or trailer or whatever. Um, Cause I, I just, it's like another thing and I don't want to deal with that world. And I get like, it's pretty, it's a big pet peeve of mine. If I'm like in a scene with somebody and they cut, and then they pull out their phone and they're like doing emails or something. I'm just like, and it's fine. Like if, if you're still doing your job well and you're focused and everything, but it just gets under my skin yeah. and it's just annoying to me. Like, yeah. I don't know. I'm with you on that because I, I like to, well, it's also, I, it's not even that I like to, I think I have to sort of, especially with single camera stuff, it's a little different doing mom with multicam, but with single camera stuff, it, I do think it's staying sort of focused, especially if I have to do something emotional. It, it is not easy. Um, What has been like your favorite character that you've played? Um, Man, I think, um, and this is something that no one's really seen, but I did this, uh, I did this short film that uh, Benicio Del Toro directed God, nine years ago now as a short film. And I played this like young American guy who goes down to Cuba for like a film festival. And it's like this night on the town and sort of what he encounters. And there was just something about that character that felt very obviously connected to me personally, but also it was just easy. It was an easy character to play. And I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed that a lot. Was um, that like stranger in a strange land kind of idea? Like, yeah, yeah, totally. A hundred percent. Yeah, it was, yeah, he was, you know, and, and two, he was like supposed to be an actor. He was in Cuba. We actually shot it in Cuba in Havana. Oh, wow. That must've been amazing. Yeah. There's a lot of realism around it. And I just felt the most comfortable I'd ever felt as an actor to just like all these things we're talking about that can like distract you and get in your head. I didn't have that. And I think because Benicio was a really great director and he set us up for success. But I, I love that character. It's probably one of my favorite things that I've ever made as an actor that like, I don't even know if it exists on YouTube. So. Oh, we got to <laughs> find it. We got to yeah, find it. That yeah. sounds awesome. Yeah. And I would yeah, imagine yeah, too great. the liveliness like of, uh, I would imagine, God, that must have been amazing. Yeah. Follow up question on that would be, how do you think your acting has shifted? You started acting at nine. Is that right? At nine. Yeah. Yeah. I was just always a very imaginative kid and very curious. And, and I think that my curiosity for people is sort of what drove me to want to act was just like understanding the minds of people and the psychological elements of it. But I think as a kid, you know, you don't go to those deep levels of like building out a character of like their past of what their relationship with their parents is. You don't like, you don't do any of that stuff. You just kind of just show up and know your lines and then try to make it seem real. And, you know, I think like in, in recent times, I've just kind of really trying to take a step deeper into it all and, and just understand who this person really is and, and how to embody their anxieties, embody their fears and kind of really build out the subtext of what they're feeling and thinking throughout a scene. And so that's kind of like been my approach now for the last few years. I love that. Yeah. I really loved working with adult actors in like the Seattle community, which is where I grew up. But um, I felt more kinship. I'm sure I was just like the annoying kid. Mm -hmm. But I, I loved that feeling of kinship being around such creative, dynamic people that were fascinating yeah. to me, that didn't treat me like a kid. That was 100%. thrilling. Yeah, I had, I had a very similar experience, like starting working on movies. And then like it was like two movies a year. And so like that was my life. And so I didn't have like a, uh, you know, quote unquote, normal childhood by any means. And I spent majority of my time on sets with adults and not in, in school with my peers and my age. So I've always like been around older people. And, and like you're saying, these creative dynamic people that I wouldn't have had access to if I weren't an actor. And that's so much, I think, of what has built me as a person are those experiences and being exposed to that at such a, a young age. And also too, why I'm really interested now in directing and and these other elements is because all my life, I've, as a kid, I was around this energy that I just fell in love with. What are you painting? And what do, do um, you use watercolor? <laughs> do you use oil? What do you do? I'm using acrylic. And I'm basically, I'm not a very good painter. Like, not even, I, I'm not even a painter. Um, so I'm just ripping off Rothko paintings and just doing like colors with like rectangles on them, like modern shit. My girlfriend's like a really cool painter and has been like developing her style and stuff. 
and she's she's yeah she's way 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 like hands and fists above me in in, in that regard for sure. I love it that you guys do, and I love your guitars. Do you play guitar? A little bit, yeah, yeah. I've been like um my my girlfriend's like classically trained Spanish guitar. Damn, um, your girlfriend's she fucking rad. She's like a badass in every way. Oh my god. Yeah, we've been like I uh, we her mom as she has like directed some short films and things in Spain, and her and I actually did the score for two of the short films and like oh, the piano amazing. and stuff like that. And so we've been, we, we mess around with music. She's much more musician than, than I am. Do you mind my asking how you guys met? We did a movie together. Oh, you did? Yeah, we've been we've been together for seven years. Huh. I love talking about her. She's the light of my life. So oh my God, she's that's amazing. amazing. Yeah. So I did the short film with Benicio, Benicio del Toro. And then there was a feature movie where he was going to play Pablo Escobar. And so I did a movie called Paradise Lost with Benicio and she played my girlfriend fiance in that movie and that was 8 years ago now so How long like into the shoot were you guys like were the, like the sparks flying I mean, I knew it the moment that I met her. Oh, was it like a rehearsal, like a table read? What was it? It was actually like a um, like a chemistry read. Oh, nice. Before she was even cast. So you um, did you do chemistry reads with a bunch of other actresses as well? Only her. Oh, okay. It was okay. only her. Yeah, yeah. It was her first time acting in English. She's from Madrid. And so it was her first time acting in English. And she flew to L.A., alone at like she was like I think 19 at that time and then she came up to my house with me and the director and we read some scenes together and I I mean I knew right away she was just an angel and it's like the purest soul I'd ever ever encountered so I was like I hope I can be good enough to to be worthy oh I was in Madrid doing press for House Bunny mm -hmm. and it was fascinating because most of the journalists were women and most of them the majority of them were very interested in sort of the strong female perspective. And I think, you know, it it was the house bunny, which is like, mm. you know, <laughs> it's like American cotton candy or something. <laughs> so anyway, my my stereotype of a Spanish woman mm -hmm. is a strong point of view. I loved that, that a lot of these journalists were getting kind of intellectual with like, you know, the, sort of the female position in society as I'm promoting the house bunny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she's a Playboy bunny. She's got a heart of gold, all right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the Spanish culture so much. I actually spend my time between here and Madrid. She's we have an apartment there together, so I, oh, I whenever fabulous. I'm not whenever I'm not working or quarantined, I'm in in Madrid. And you know, I think that for me culturally the thing that I love so much is the conversations that you have with people just feel very real. It feels very genuine. And that like point of view, that perspective, it's, you know, I, I find a lot of times and, you know, I love America and I love being an American, but I find that there's a lot of, you know, uh, posturing or there's like um, a certain superficiality that really exists with, within a lot of conversations that I have with people here. And, and in Spain, it exists, but it's just so much less. And I feel like there's just something that's real, like of the earth human to human connecting passion honesty communication like these are things that i admire and and i experience a lot uh when i'm when i'm there right yeah so you lived in the oakwood apartments oh my goodness <laughs> i did hey dear listeners so the oakwood apartments it's a complex i've stayed there for a weekend but josh why don't you describe what the oakwood apartments are so the oakwood apartments are this this magical grouping of <laughs> like over <laughs> over a thousand apartments spread out on the side of the back side of the Hollywood sign hill, basically. That's where this is. So yeah, so it's like it's uh, you know, bordering on the valley, like Studio City. Yeah. Right? Yep. Exactly. It over it overlooks like Warner Brothers Studios in Studio City. And and basically it is like the mecca of child actors. If they came to LA, they stayed at Oakwood at some point. I did six years there. I was Whoa! six years in that place. Shit. Yeah. And it was some of the best years of my life, to be honest. It's a crazy place. I loved it because I didn't go to school as a kid and I didn't have friends. And so like for me, I was around all these other kids from all over the country who were similar to me, who wanted to do this and like were like kind of these like charismatic, rambunctious kids. So I had a great time and I met many friends from there. And, and you know, it's um, it, it was a magical place, but it's also there's a dark side uh, of the Oakwood. Um, which is you see kids who are there because their parents are forcing them to be because their parents wanted to be actors and didn't make it. And I had an encounter one time where I, I had like started to get callbacks, which was like, that's a big deal. And um, I was like probably 10 or 11. And um, these three moms came up to me and my mom wasn't there. And they were like, honey, we're so proud of you. You're doing such great work. 
our son actually has this, the same audition you guys are going out for. We were wondering if you could show us how you were going to do it so we can maybe help our kid. No. I was like, this feels like an uh-oh situation. I've heard of these. This, this feels wrong. I was like, I don't know the lines. That's what you yeah, said? Exactly. Good, quick thinking. I was like, I was like, I was like, I don't, I don't know it. They're like, oh, we had the sides. We can, we, they literally had the sides with them. And I was like, I actually, I can't right now. Um, I got, is this like by the pool? I need like, or is this in a hall? This, this like, is, where? So, like they have like the two clubhouses, you know, like where they have yeah. like, the gym, like the little media oh, right, room. Right, right, right. On, on Sundays, they have a, uh, a brunch that they do like a free brunch where it's just like donuts and like sugary juice. And I, I loved it as a kid. I was, I, I was a little porker. I was like, I love to eat. I still do. Um, but like, so for me, free donuts was like, hallelujah. So it was at, it was in this like clubhouse setting and I was like stuffing my face with like a jelly filled or something. And, uh, and that's, that's when I was approached. That's crazy. So you, yeah. did you, I didn't do oh. it. No, no, I ran, I ran. Good I ran for you. I, you get, I ran, I ran home. Uh, I don't, I don't remember. I remember that <laughs> I, the story is so like vivid in my mind. I, I don't even think, I think it was like, it could have even been for like a commercial or for something, like something, whatever. I don't right, know. Right, but it right, was, right. That, that, but that, that story just always has been embedded in my mind. The sabotage, yeah. the mom sabotage. Yeah. Oh I my know. God. It was crazy. <gasps> Flying V formation, the whole thing. Oh. <laughs> okay. So what was the first big acting job that you booked? Big in what way? Okay. What was a very defining role that you got in your life? For me, it was like, because, you know, I've been asked a similar question of like, when did you knew that you had made it as an actor? Oh, God. And like, for me, I was like, I mean, honestly, the moment that I walked onto the very first set of my entire life, I was like, I'm here. I'm good. This is my life now. Done. Like, this is what I'm doing. And that was a TV movie for Animal Planet called Miracle Dogs. Um, that was about magical dogs that could lick people and heal them. And it was a fantastic little film. <laughs> um, so, uh, that was like my. You first were just movie like covered set. in like baby food. Yeah, completely. yeah, yeah. Um, but then, like I like the first kind of like uh, the bigger thing that really I felt like was like making me move somewhere was uh, the Polar Express. I did like the motion capture with Tom Hanks and Robert Zemeckis and all of this as as a ten year old. I was playing like the boy, and so like that experience for me was it was incredible. I, mean, I don't even think at that time I really could grasp the luck and the everything associated with being able to work with these people. But looking back on it, like it was so formative. It was such a highly technical movie too. I mean, I would imagine so much is about sort of the precision. Yes and no. I mean, there were things about it that had to be very precise, but as a, as the actual performance goes and like what you're able to do, you had freedom to move, you had freedom to do anything. And so in that way, it was actually very non-restrictive even because they didn't have a physical camera. They literally just built a set like of oh, like wow. rebar and shit in the middle of a soundstage. And then like it was almost like directed like a play kind of how you would like move through the scene. You could like do anything. You don't have to worry about where the cameras were at all. So there's a lot of freedom in that. But for me, that was a huge, huge learning experience just to be around that high a level of, of, of filmmakers is like so formative and, and, and gave me such a base of love of, of a set and of like the crew and of the team and, and loving seeing how this whole thing worked. This was Robert Zemeckis. Like it's insane. Like as a 10 year old. So that, that to me was like the thing I think that made me be like, start to really get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I did Yogi Bear 3D. Okay. I okay. didn't, I didn't have a lot of movement, Josh. Yeah. I didn't have oh, a lot no. of freedom. <laughs> it was like stand so here sorry. and go Yogi. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. <laughs> yeah, you and you did it. And I you sure loved did, it. Yogi. <laughs> oh, God. Um, okay, so I want to do some deal breakers, but I, can I ask you some life questions first? Yeah. Okay. You can say pass at any time. Okay. Um, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? I, I don't like ice cream. <laughs> you don't like ice cream, All right? Yeah. Do you have a frozen yeah. treat that you like? I like frozen uh, frozen bananas dipped in chocolate. Oh yeah, that's good. Do you like nuts? Nuts? No nuts? Nah. nah. I give give or take. If it has nuts on it and I want it, I'll eat it. Okay, but I don't well now, go for it. now your diet is intriguing to me. You love Madrid, so I assume you eat yamon, right? Actually, I don't eat meat. You we don't, don't eat, eat meat. We don't eat meat. No, so, no, we eat, we're we're pescatarian. My girlfriend. Oh, okay. So we eat fish. Yeah. So, what's your favorite like style of cuisine? Japanese, mm, for sure. Yeah, I'm a, I love sushi. I love all the flavors of Japanese cuisine. It's it's. I, I would eat sushi. Every meal of the day, including like 7 a.m. breakfast, if I could. I was like, going to ask you what the first thing you're going to do after this, after we're allowed. It's going to be going to a sushi restaurant. Do you have a favorite sure. one? My barometer for like sushi that I will eat is so low. I will eat like 
gas station sushi. If I like, <laughs> I, I will eat any kind of sushi. So I'll, I'll go anywhere. All right. What was your favorite toy as a child? I loved Legos, Legos and, and Lincoln logs. But truthfully, like as a kid in Kentucky, it was always about your bike and your friends. And you would like go in the summertime. That was like the greatest thing. You just go on endless bike rides in the neighborhoods. And oh, have fun, like freedom. It's, it's like I, I think back to that and I just see this warm, like hot Kentucky air and like this like band of like weird I'm totally kids on their imagining bikes you and, guys like jumping ugh. off a train trellis into like honestly it, it wasn't quite stand by me but it was you know it was it was in that world did you ever want to stop acting i did i did i was um i had a point when i was i think 16 at 16 i was a very difficult kid for a while why do you think i, I was rebelling against everything i was just a very rebellious kid and i think that Partially, you know, my parents always tried to raise me and my brother with this idea of, you know, mutual respect and all this stuff. But I think that there was something about me having so many constraints on my life being like a working child from nine to 16 that I just wanted like I wanted normalcy. I started to be sad about missing like being a normal teenager, or a normal kid. And so at that point, I went back to Kentucky and I was going to quit acting and I stopped for like one semester of high school. I went into high school for one semester after having already made movies and been like famous in my town and whatnot. And it was hell. Like it was the acting and living that life is so much better than what I had experienced. I was like, I'm not, I'm, I'm so lucky and I'm an asshole for thinking like kicking a gift horse in the mouth. Like what was hellacious about it? If I thought that my life was structured and too much responsibility of working as an actor, going to high school was so much more structured and so much more pressure and responsibility than I felt as being an actor on set. Like that's, that's like how I don't know how ki- I don't know how teenagers do it. And I applaud anyone who finished high school, even those who tried I, 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 to me. It's 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 crazy. Josh, you're so right. Michael, my partner, has a 16 year old daughter. She'd be so thrilled to meet you. Do you think that Margo wants to come down? Oh, yeah. Because she's going through all this stuff and it's intense yeah. to watch. Yeah. College, social pressure. There's so much. Yeah. And I love what you were saying earlier about social media. But yeah. How did fame affect your social standing? Like, did it? make things easier or harder? I don't know because I never saw another version. Right. I don't know what each individual's experience was. I mean, for me, it had its positives and negatives. You know, there was some bullying from kids who were, you know, bullies. Uh, And then, you know, there was some like ass kissing from those people who like, you know, saw the, the fame as something that they should kiss up to in a way. But it was just, it was weird. It was weird. It was, I needed to do it. And I'm really, really grateful that I did. Um, and I'm really thankful that my parents supported that like need of discovery at that age. But uh, I'm very happy that I, I kept, I went back to acting. <laughs> that was a very short lived. So did you miss like, I don't know, did you romanticize like prom or, or like camp or like. <laughs> I've got a great story about prom actually. Yeah. So, so <laughs> when I was, I think I was 16, it was around that same time. And I, um, I was being homeschooled in Kentucky. And I really wanted to go to a prom. I had a girlfriend at the time and she was also homeschooled and we were 16 years old, which is just weird. And so there was a group that was doing a homeschool prom. And so we literally went and we did a homeschool prom event. One of like the kids rented a limo. And so like all the kids got in and we drove and it was literally in like the basement of a church. It was crazy. I love that. This episode is brought to you in part by Plant Botanical. As everyone slowly comes out of hiding, many of you are asking the same questions. Am I ready for actual human contact? Should I swipe right? Will they look like their picture? Do I look like my picture? Is that the face of an ax murderer? Do I really wanna take off these sweats? And for those of you who get that far, what drink should I be casually sipping? I have the answer to that one. While your date sits awkwardly silent, stunned by your good looks, dazzled by your intellect, or wondering how to dispose of your body, the drink in your hand should be delicious, refreshing, crisp, clean, plant botanical vodka seltzer. Weighing in at only one carb, made with real fruit and botanicals traditionally used for stamina, immunity, and detox, Plant Botanical is already thinking about your future encounters. Follow and DM at Plant Loves You and share a story or video of your funniest, wildest, or most awkward date for a chance to win up to $1,000 for your next one. 
Plant Botanical, your perfect companion while you look for your perfect companion. Available at Target, Pavilions, Vons, Total Wine, or visit plantlovesyou.com to find a store near you. Plant Vodka and Vodka Seltzer, just the good shit. Josh, this is Margot. Hi. She's, hey, yeah, how's she's it going? 16. We were just talking about, Josh was telling me that, um, <laughs> Josh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but he was saying that no, he no. went to, what year were you when you went to high school? Was it would have been sophomore year? 16. What year is that? Sophomore? sophomore? Yeah. Yeah, probably. So yeah. Josh went to school for one semester and he was like, it's, what did you say? It, it was so hard. It was, it was like, I, cause I, I had been living this life and acting for so many years that I was like, I'm quitting acting. I just want to be a normal teenager. I want to have a normal life. I want to go to high school. And I went and I, I applaud anyone who does high school like, and, and has like made it through that, that gauntlet because it was so challenging. The social dynamics were so complicated. And that was a little bit before, like now when social media and like the interaction is very different um, that I just applaud anyone who has even attempted high school because it was just really, really challenging for me. Yeah, and she's an amazing student, and yeah. that's amazing. But fuck, I oh, it, God. yeah, it, it was it, it was hard. And, and, but two at sixteen, I was I was also I was really angry. I was an angry kid at that time, and I ended up going through a lot of therapy to like you know reprogram some some ways of thinking. But I was just very angry. Do you know why? Do you know what the root of that was? I mean, I think most sixteen year olds yeah. are. I, I mean, I was. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I mean, like, I got arrested. Like, that's like the level, like, I, I was like sneaking out of my house. I had like, I've got scars on my fists from like punching through like walls and mirrors. And I was just like full of rage. And I, I think it was because honestly, and of course, I'm going to blame my parents to some extent, because to some extent, it is their fault. But it was I, I, I didn't feel that I had a space to express myself as angered or sad with them. Because my mom is extremely, extremely optimistic. And very bubbly and positive, and which is like one of her greatest virtues that's taught me so much and to see the beauty in things always. But when you're an angry teenager and you just want someone to say, like, I understand you, I understand what you're feeling and your sadness and your anger. And I didn't feel that I had that. And maybe I did and it was in my own head and I just whatever, but I expressed it through anger and aggression and all these things. Um, and then I went through therapy um, that really just got me to gave me tools to learn how to think about things differently, to uh, how to deal with those feelings. Um, and, it, and it changed me forever. Those things are, st are still things I use today. I think that's so wise what you said. And it's interesting for me, I was really angry because I felt like I, you know, I wasn't very popular. I was really quiet and I was just waiting for my world to expand. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about you, you already had this large world that you had experienced. Mm -hmm. And then, so then to like contain it back into like the microcosm of high school, I would imagine that would be, um, I would imagine that would be frustrating. It was a disaster, but you know, I, it's something I had to do. You know, I, I think that it brought out a lot of my anger problems. It brought out a lot of my anxiety and my fears and all these things brought them to the very forefront of my existence. And so I had to deal with them. And so because of that, I'm eternally grateful to my therapist who was able to do that. My parents for staying by my side through all of that, even though I was a complete asshole. You have a little brother? Yeah. Do you guys get along really well? We get along great. He's he's great. During that time, because I, I asked this because my I have an older brother and whenever he was kind of like the rebellious, angry one, I would sort of subconsciously become like the good kid. But then he went off to college mm. and he was doing great in college. And that's when I was like, fuck this noise. I hate <laughs> this town. I hate this shit. Ah. So it, it was always like a little bit of a balance. I just wonder about those dynamics. If like, yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. I mean, my brother's name's Connor. He's extremely intelligent. He went to Georgia tech, has a degree in engineering. Uh, micro math and German, like he's, he's a brilliant minded young guy. He's 23 now, I think 23. Yeah. And, um, you know, at, at that time I was such a terror and sucking, I think so much energy from our family that I think that he kind of, in a way sort of re receded into himself in ways. And, and, and I don't think it was so much, he became like the de, de facto good kid. It was just more like we had to deal with your brother shit right now. So like you just, you know, you're fine. Like, it, so I, right. I feel bad too. in that way, I, I feel like guilt for, for that time of not having, um, being so selfish, you know, and as a 16 year old going through that in that moment, that is your world and you're, you are selfish. It's like part of your growth as a person. 
but you know, I, I have, you know, some lingering pain and, and guilt from, from that time in my life for sure. I think that's really generous of you to do self-reflection. I think, especially in our industry, it can be difficult to, mm. to do that. I mean, I guess it's, it's, it takes courage from anybody for sure. Yeah. Okay. So I was watching some YouTube things and you uh, were on Jimmy Fallon mm-hmm. and speaking of the gibberish language that Margot knows. Oh, to go. That used yeah, to yeah. make us crazy. You haven't done it in a lo- so long. Okay, wait, wait, Margot, will you come? Will you, do you, can, do you still remember it, Josh? Yeah. I don't, I, even, I don't even understand the prince. It seems like it's basic, but it is also. It is. 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 To go, I got to go, see it again. How to go to go, do to go, where to get, where to get bright again. But I got it again. You do go photo go, get a guess. I got another guy. You do go, get again. Total go to the lady. I got another stay again. I guess. Let it get a guess. Okay. I think you just said, yeah. Then you'll ask me. Yeah. Um, wait, Margo, you do some. I don't know. I don't know how to do it. It gets pretty good. Did it get it? Is it a guy? Little girl. Did it get it again? Little guy. Get again. Little guy. Get again. Little guy. Get again. What's the origin of this? What's it called? <laughs> gibberish. Gibberish. Yeah, just called gibberish. What's the origin of it? Who came up with um, this? I believe it was born in um, in North Carolina on a farm. There was a farm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. I <laughs> but it's been the a, origin. Did you did you speak? Gibberish when you were in high school? No, it, it was it was it was something I did at Oakwood. That was an Oakwood oh, apartment. Oh, oh yeah, that's yeah, totally yeah, yeah. that's an Oakwood lesson. Yeah. All right, I love it. Yeah, and there's but there's there's variations too. Like what? Ebe naba ebe slabek ebe ebe slabek ebe 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 if it's if it's super br- 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 weird, br- 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 <laughs> if it's it's like it sounds like you're like underwater, like bubbly or something. It's, so it's wait, the same principle though. But wait, Josh, wait, tell us more about the uh, prom at home. Oh yeah, it was it was a homeschool prom, and this group was throwing it for all the kids in the region who were homeschooled and wanted to have a prom experience, and it was being thrown in like the basement of a church. And it was all homeschool kids that didn't know each other coming together for a prom. <laughs> I mean, like, look, there's a lot of reasons that kids are homeschooled and it works really well for some people. One thing that is missing a lot of times is social interaction. And if you take the combination of homeschooled children in Kentucky who have social skill problems and then bring them all together for a prom, <laughs> it is a magical world. It was it was crazy. <laughs> I, again, that was a time where I was so crazy that like, I don't even know what I was thinking or feeling, but uh, I remember the images very vividly. And it was, uh, you know, there was drama. My, my girlfriend at the time, her and I got into an argument and like, were these like jealous, angry little teenage love things. And it was just like full of all the disaster that one would expect from a prom, let alone a homeschool prom. <laughs> All my life, like, I was very basic in the mind of, like, I want to find true romance, love, like, deep, passionate, eternal love. Like, I, I bought into all this. Like, I, I bought into it. So from, like, age 10, I was falling in love left and right. Like, I was just like, I love this. I, I, this, I, I was just like that kid that just fell in love with everybody all the time. And so, yeah, but at 16, you're discovering so much about yourself, about your own physicality, your sexuality, your hormones, your connection with people. It just it's just such a big collision of all these things together. It's like you're a semi truck. Like Yeah, it was it was fun. It was disastrous. And I, I grew a, a lot from from that time in my life. My first boyfriend I didn't have until I was a senior uh, in high school. And I think I mean, I look back feeling like, oh, I was in love, but because I don't want to disqualify it, like, oh, I was too immature mm-hmm. to be in love or whatever. But it was a different kind of love that I feel now. And it was so much less about him. Yeah. You know, it was yeah, it yeah, was like that. me and the idea. Yeah. And I was I was a very awkward kid. I still am pretty awkward. But and he was like a good looking <laughs> dude. And I couldn't believe that he liked me. So I would do anything for him. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, my mom raised me to be a really proud person. Anyway, when when he he broke up with me, I was just gutted. I was like, you know, I was in a funk for four months, maybe. Oh, yeah. But I didn't even really like him. (laughs) It was all (laughs) about me. (laughs) Completely. It was all about like my own personal rejection and acceptance and then the rejection. It was just all like. Yeah, I think that goes back to like a very, a very natural thing for that 
age, at least in my life, I was very selfish. I was very self-centered and you can't see outside of your own shit at that point in time. And like, I, I don't, I won't disqualify, like, cause my first love was definitely like a, a real love. And I, I love that person and we love being together and all these things, but you're, you're right. There's a lot of the idea of it, but there's also like, we had this addiction to like toxicity to and each other. And like this, it was, it was very passionate and very real. And, and, and it developed me in a lot of ways that were great. And I learned a lot of things, but yeah, it love it's different with every person like that you fall in love with. I think that love grows and changes. I've been with my girlfriend now for seven years and just recognizing when you like love someone and that you want to be a part of their world of helping to help them pass their own fears and anxieties and help them get through their own shit so they can become the best versions of themselves. That's like when I have like felt like, oh, I'm, this is love. Like I, I care. That's, that's so important, you know? Well, and then when I moved, like in my twenties, when I moved, when I first moved here to LA, I think I was 22 and I immediately fell into a relationship. Like we moved in together four months and then we got married and then we got divorced. But I spent the decade of my twenties with my ex-husband and there were a lot of great things. We are divorced, however, but, um, <laughs> but I think that I was at that time too, I was looking for an anchor here in LA because, you know, I was like, auditioning like you remember like three times a day or whatever like oh, yeah, racing yeah, yeah. all over town with yeah, a thomas yeah. guide and just like <laughs> yeah completely yeah <laughs> and um so to have something that was familiar that was some you know somebody that i could come home to was something that i i think i, I really craved so once again it was like it wasn't about him necessarily it was it was about me and i i think it's just interesting how during that time too it was like the recognizing the shifts in in love and how like we've um i don't know if it's as we get older our emotions are not dampened but i feel less erratic maybe well i, I think it has to do a lot with like getting to know yourself too you know i think that it's it's really easy to fall into a relationship to not look at your own problems not get your own shit to like have something else to focus on and so i think like it, it takes years and for some people more than others and some people can figure it out quickly. Um, but it's, I, I think it has a lot to do with figuring out what is important to you and learning that you can't control a feeling, but you can control how you're looking at something, your perspective on things. And that is where then that can influence the change of your emotions instead of like something, somebody saying or doing something and it makes you angry or sad immediately. Think about it from a different perspective and, and that can then change how that influences your emotion. So yeah. it's like no one, like you can't deny an emotion. It, it, that's a feeling, but they come from thoughts. And so you can work on that element of it and, and become more logical. And maybe that's what happens too, is you get more logical. You, you, you start to realize like, is that really something I need to be angry about? Is that something right. that really bothers me that right. much? Yeah, am I, am I going to make I, an active you know, choice in this? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I think that that's part of just experience and life and growing and, and, and living. Josh, I want to get back to life questions, but first, um, will you ask Margo if she has a boyfriend? Because I'm too scared. Do you have a boyfriend, Margo? I do not have a boyfriend. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she's been quite. She just got her. She got you got your driver's license like four days before before. Oh. Yeah. I know. Oh, I God. know. I know. I remember when I got my driver's license. It was like the thing I've been looking forward to. Up until I turned 15 and a half in Kentucky at that time. And it was like freedom. It was like freedom. And now you're quarantined. Wow. I like drive that's, around the block. It's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, that's good. You can get some practice with less cars around, I guess. But yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's unfortunate. Okay. Well, this question may or may not be applicable to you. What was your first boss like? Well, I, I never, I've never had a job. <laughs> You're like Robert Zemeckis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> when I was, so again, 16 is a very like important time in my life where like I went through a lot um, and I was very, all the aggressivity and craziness. And so my, uh, my parents had decided that like some structured real work would be good for me. So my dad had a friend who was a construction foreman. Um, and so I went and would like hay fields, like hay fields, like in the middle of the summer, like Kentucky heat. And he was a great boss. He was great. And it was somebody to talk to. And I mean, he was doing it as a favor, but you know, it was, it was, it was good. I love that. You must've been yeah. a great worker for you to describe him as a great boss. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So what is your greatest fear? Hmm. Greatest fear. I know. There's just so many. <laughs> <laughs> I think my greatest fear is not experiencing all that I can in life. 
of like arriving at that final moment of death, whether it's sudden and soon or years away. I, I tried to live without regret and I really try to, you know, do things and, and live life you know, to the fullest. But I also have social anxiety and that stops me a lot of times from going and doing a lot of things and, and entering into other things I'm not comfortable with. So I think that's probably a pretty, a pretty big fear. Do you like talk shows? You know, what's crazy is I black out. I don't know what I say or do in a talk show. I literally will like go out there. I'm so nervous that it'll just all happen. And then I'll walk off afterwards and be like, what did I say? Did I do something wrong? Did I, what did I say? Like, I, I'm like, I don't know. I genuinely cannot tell you one thing that I said. <laughs> I do enjoy it because I like being funny and I like talking and, and I like humans and interacting. But I, I think that I compartmentalize it every single time. So that says something. Oh, I'm always like, this story is not going to be funny at all. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's know. not even a story. And it's like, it's like they, they're going to set you up with a prompt to get you into your right. story. But it's like, you know, it's coming. But then it's like, how? Yeah, it's, it's so weird. It's I know. So weird. I know. And it's like, maybe the producer liked it when I told but why? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So what is your favorite sick rainy day movie? Oh, boy. Um... It might be, it might be Benjamin Button. Really? Yeah. I've never seen just, it. It's a great movie. It's David Fincher, uh, Brad Pitt. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's fantastic. It's uh, but it's, it's such a, like a, it's a life story. You know, you're, you're experiencing this life and love and loss. It's like, it's like a Forrest Gump kind of feel in ways, but it's David Fincher. So it's got like that style to it in a way that I, I love it. I want to get back to your answer that that reminds me because you're talking about sort of a life journey. But when you're talking about living life to its fullest or, or your greatest mm-hmm. fear is dying or, or missing opportunity, mm-hmm. do you have specific bucket list things? No, it's just like, so when I was a kid, like young kid, like seven, eight years old, I would lay in bed at night and cry myself to sleep thinking about death and thinking about like, that moment and finality of it and everything that you've ever known and loved and cared about and lived would just be gone forever. And it's be a blackness void. And I would just like cry myself to sleep. So it's, it's more about like getting to that moment and being like, I missed out on things, not even knowing what those things are. I don't have like, I want to live for a month on the coast of Italy, or I want to, you know, do there's nothing like that. It's just, uh, Wanting to live to the fullest and hopefully not have regrets when that happens. Do you have a character that you would love to play? I would, I would love to play Jeff Buckley because I, I've been obsessed with him forever. Has there been anything? You would be amazing at that. Has there been anything? There has been. There was a movie, I think, that Penn Badgley did maybe like quite a few years ago. Um, I, I also cannot sing at all. Uh, so it's a huge hurdle because uh, <laughs> he has like one of the greatest voices. Uh, but just like if I could sing... My dream character would be Jeff Buckley. <laughs> I know you can do this, Josh. I love that uh, idea. It is shocking how bad I can do accents. I can imitate. I can do voices. I can all these crazy things. I cannot get my voice to sing in tune. I can't either. Okay. What is your favorite? Uh, do you have a favorite book or author or like a book that you've read multiple times? Not really. I'm ashamedly very underread. I like that admittance. I haven't read for a long time. I was never like pushed as a child to read books. It was not like a thing that anyone in my family did at all ever. And so I just, I never like got that bug of like getting a good book and like diving in. I've, I've, I've been getting into it some more. I, I really like um, Nabokov. I read Lolita and now I'm reading um, The Real Life of Sebastian Knight. But like I've read, honestly, it's an embarrassingly no, low number. I've probably read seven, eight books in my life. I, that's one of my biggest embarrassments and things I feel horrible about. And I got to change it. I just have to do it. I have to do it. <laughs> okay, wait. So what is a trait you most dislike in others? I, a trait I dislike? My God, I don't have one. I'm really, I'm really trying to think. I, I, I don't like, what's yours? Like, what would be a thing you would say for this? Um, to like help my mind kickstart. I don't like pettiness. But I'm not, I because I don't get too irritated with people in general. Yeah. I think, I don't know, lack of consideration, lack of empathy, probably. That, of, that, that, when you started, this is that's exactly where my mind started to go to, Yeah, lack of empathy. Or just an unawareness, Yeah, I think, is like something that's really frustrating to me. Like, you do not like, you just can't think about anything except for this. Like, you right. can't think beyond that. That's That's very frustrating. And I think that for people in our industry, too, where there's that weird thing where because of what we do, we sometimes get treated with more privilege. And I think it can be poisoning and it can be it can be overwhelming sometimes too. Like suddenly you are treated as though you're of more value. Yeah. And that really can fuck with one's head. And it also makes you feel 
guilty and and not very deserving i guess of like a hundred percent kids would tell me that they wanted to be famous and i'm sure that you mm-hmm. got that too like what do you want to be when you grow up i want to be famous i'm 43 i love it that i had to think about that um but <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't sort of part of like the dialogue growing up and i think that like social media has made fame in and of itself become a profession and it's amazing that I wouldn't have any idea how to make a TikTok. Um, Margot's, yeah. she promised me that she'll explain to me what TikTok is. I, but, I don't either. I, I, I do find it funny. Like there's like a lot of actors and people who are quarantined right now and their kids are like, do a TikTok with me. And they're like, okay, <laughs> like trying to do this like thing. It's, honestly, I, I don't know what it is. I don't <laughs> understand it. I'm with you on this one, but I respect it. I respect it. Um, no, I, I, I completely agree. I, I think there has been this like, being famous, you know, you can, you can monetize it being famous now with, yeah. with, you know, Instagram and getting paid and all these things. And, and, and it is such like a foreign thing to me. I used to have like, uh, when people would ask me questions about, you know, how does it feel to be famous now? And, and all these things to me. And I would say, you know, it has its ups and downs and da, 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 or like, I, you know, I would start to complain in some way, which is so ungracious and unfair. And I've grown far away from that, but you know, they, they would say like, yeah, but you know, when you started acting, you obviously being famous is like part of it. It's like part of what happens. Yeah. And I was like, look, I started at nine years old because I found out that you can make movies. I did it for that. I I did not do this in any way to get notoriety, to get fame, to get attention. I actually don't like attention. I got a job that is like, I happen to have a thing that I can do well and I love doing it. But what comes with that is like this level of attention and like putting you, like you're saying, and this like other level of like value or importance. And I, I can't stand that. I it, It's something that used to like, especially during hunger Games stuff, when all that was at its height, it would eat me alive and I would become so reclusive and so like just tormented in ways. Oh gosh. It was, it was, it was crazy. It's crazy. And, and, and yeah, I would, I would get very angry. People said like, you chose this. I'm like, I didn't, I didn't choose this. I just wanted to be an actor. Yeah. And there's a lot of perks and there's a lot of things that I'm beyond grateful for and super lucky and I'm very aware, but it is crazy. Yeah. There's that yeah. feeling of like, I don't know, the pressure to be something other than human, I guess. I, I don't know if I'm articulating yeah. this well, but I think it does make one want to stay at home. I agree. Yeah. It's a weird, weird thing. And, you know, anonymity is something that is hard to wrap your head around losing until you've lost it. That's a really hard thing to like actually conceive of that like when you lose your anonymity, that's everywhere you go, you are aware that people look at you and they know your name, they know your face, they, they may have seen you in something, they think they know things about you. Like actually conceptualizing that without having had lost it, I think is really hard. And so I think that when people are like, what are you complaining about? You know, like, come on, I, I get it. I totally get it. And I try my best to not complain because I'm beyond fortunate and lucky in all these things. But there is something to be said about the what is the price of anonymity? I don't know. I don't know because I lost it a long time ago. So I don't really like have a. I realized I'd never been. I'd never been to a bar with my friends without being aware that people look right. at me and see. You know, and and just it's and it, it sounds like something that's like not a big deal and like oh yeah, but you're famous or you get whatever. And I I, I get that. I totally get that. But if you had that taken from you, right. it's very, it's a very tricky weird weird dynamic to figure out. Well, I'm sure you get recognized. Uh, all over the world, but is Madrid, is it a little less intense? I mean, yes and no. I I think that, you know, like like a fan of the Hunger Games in Madrid is going to react similarly to a a fan of the Hunger Games here. You know, it has a huge fandom and like that whole world is like another level of something that I can't even comprehend. I I think uh, I feel more comfortable in Spain letting my guard down more quickly than I do here when I go places. I feel like in Spain, if it happens, if I get recognized, there's something that I, it's usually pretty easy and I, I don't have as much anxiety about it right. as opposed to when it happens here. I don't know. I don't know exactly what or why, but I feel differently about it. Yeah. Okay. What is the trait you most dislike in yourself? Um, I procrastinate quite a bit and I don't do shit until it's absolutely like pertinent that this needs to happen right now. And so that, that to me is a trait I don't like. And it's annoying to me and I want to change it. Are you talking about like dishes or painting? Uh, ev- everything. Everything. Like, oh, like I have four scripts that I need to read. Right. Okay. To whom would you most like to apologize and why? Um, I've done a lot of apologizing. I, I usually stay up to date on my apologies. I think my, my younger brother, I think that like what we went through as a family, just with this whole crazy machine that has become 
was my life and acting and everything is just really difficult. And I have feelings of, of guilt surrounding the time just being young and my mom and dad, like separating our family for me to be in California working and my dad in Kentucky and my brother. And just like, it's, it, and, and there's been a lot of great things. I know I feel that he doesn't harbor any negative feelings about it, but I just still feel sorry for some of those things. I think that's a that's an incredible answer. I really do. That mm. is that's really that's that's a beautiful answer. It makes me want to apologize to my brother. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. What do you consider your greatest achievement? I honestly would say the last like couple years, like expressing myself and communicating honestly, and not like trying to worry too much about doing it in the right way or like micro manipulating people and these kinds of things that you didn't even like wasn't even aware of. I just done like a lot of work on that lately. And I'm, I think it's a pretty big achievement for me. Josh, I have to tell you, you're so introspective. You're so intelligent. <laughs> you're so engaging. You have great stories. Oh, I appreciate it. Okay, wait, we're not done. I know that sounded like a wrap it up thing, but it no, wasn't. No, no, it was just a <laughs> compliment that I want to give you. Um, okay. <laughs> In one word, how would you like to be remembered? Genuine. I love that. That's good. I think I, I think that it's something that like I was saying, all those other things I've been working on, it's 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 a hard thing to to get and hold. And like and what it even really means to be genuine to what? To whom? To yourself, to the, what you think your idea of yourself is, and just like all of those dynamics. Like genuine, I'd like to be remembered for that. I think that's awesome. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Best Fiends. We all know there really is only one match three style game worth playing. It's the one with an actual storyline, cool collectible characters, and nonstop action-packed adventure. It's the one with literally thousands of challenging puzzles to solve. And yes, I'm using the word literally correctly. Of course, I'm talking about best fiends. You meet your best fiends early in their careers. They don't have much experience, but they have heart. I recognized a little piece of myself in each of them. And so I began to assemble the perfect team. I watched them grow as we solved puzzle after puzzle, working hard and playing hard. Today, my best fiends are ready to go anytime and anywhere. I'm really proud of what they have become. With new challenges and levels added all the time, there's never a boring moment. So download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best beans. Okay, we're going to call one of our listeners and try to give some un- unqualified advice. Okay. Hey. Hey, Evan. Hi, how are you guys? Oh, we're great. Well, you know, we're at home. I'm here with Josh Hutchinson. Hello, how are you? Good, man. How are you? I'm I'm doing well. You know, it's uh, crazy, crazy times that we're all living in, but uh, trying to maintain sanity. Evan, tell us what's going on. Um, So I got out of an engagement in July of last year. It was rough. I moved down to be with her, have, you know, help her graduate college and all of that. Um, and we were together for almost two years. She ended the engagement a month before it was going to be two years. So that was really rough. And I never really got a chance to mourn anything. Um, I work as a professional actor, so I went into rehearsal during that time. And then I got a new dream teaching job. And then I met my newest girlfriend, who is just incredibly perfect for me. And the problem that I'm having, though, why I called is that I just keep thinking about the relationship constantly. And like, there was a period where the things I used to love, I hated during that time. And now I'm starting to relove them. And You know, I guess my question is, is it normal not to grieve over like a huge life change like that? Because my problem is I can't seem to get over it. I can't seem to like let it go. I guess since I've been so busy, like constantly busy from that time, like how can I make sure that I can give all of my energy to this new relationship, which is going really well. I actually proposed to her a couple of days ago during the quarantine. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Well, when you think about your old relationship, do you, do you think about it with a a lot of negativity? I mean, is it usually like when you, when you talk about mourning, what is that space feel like it should be to you? Is it anger? Is it sadness? Is it wistfulness? 
Is it a uh, rejection? I think it's a combination of anger and rejection. Like, I mean, I proposed to this person. We were going to spend the rest of our lives together. And then in the span of 72 hours, it was, we're not compatible. You know, all of the aspirations and dreams you have, I can't support, you know, that kind of thing. And I think just, we never really resolved it. She actually decided to enter into a new relationship about a month after the breakup. So while I was going through all of this kind of, emotional turmoil and you know trying to keep my mind off of self-destruction she was getting a new partner and this new partner has a kid has a full-time job you know all of that kind of all the things that we wanted to have together she just got immediately are you in contact with her in any way no i haven't spoken to her in about eight or nine months so it sounds to me evan most of the relationships that I've been in, the guy has ended it. I mean, with plenty of, like, I, I mean, the cards were, I, I was shown the card. I was shown his hand, like, you know, years before the breakup happened or whatever. But I, you know, I can get a little blind sometimes. But um, I don't really believe in the idea of closure. I think at least when people say, I, I just need closure or whatever. And Evan, I don't know if this is sort of where you're going, but I don't think that happens. I think that these uh, relationships are very valuable scars and it's a life well lived. I think if you've been heartbroken and rejected, I, I think that that's how you, we have to think about things. I, and I understand that it, you, you may have like confusion about the rejection too. I guess kind of the, the biggest question I have is when, when did these thoughts come into her head? Cause she was the one that ended things and all of that. Like a lot of the things she said were incredibly um, kind of detrimental. I work as a music teacher and she's like, you can't support me with that. Like you can't be what I need you to be for me with that job. So I can't support it. So Evan, it's like your rational head is telling you that relationship was wrong and your new relationship is great. Right. Josh, do you have thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, 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 I totally get that and feel that pain a hundred percent. That's extremely difficult when something like that just throws up in that way and, and everything all of a sudden there's like a big quantum shift. I think that, for me, I, I agree with, with with what Anna was saying too about about closure. I think that it's 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 really about when you love somebody and you have that like deep love connection. I think that that love lives on forever. And you know, you may you might view it through a different lens from time to time, or there might be more anger, or there might be some like wistfulness about it. But I I, I think that that you if if I was in your position, what I think I would feel is that I have to I would have to recognize that this relationship it wasn't going to work. It was going to come to this point sooner or later. If, if these are the things that, that, that she was experiencing and feeling and in a way it's better that it happened. And it's like, you can just move away from that and now put your energy into this, this new love that it sounds like from what you're saying works for you in a, in a bigger way. So I, I think that it, in, in a way, it just sounds to me like if, it's inevitable that at some point or another, and maybe it would have been like after you had gotten this job and been working and then you thought things were great and happy. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's like, you know, two years into a marriage and then it falls apart. And that's even, I think, probably more difficult. So in a way, as difficult and painful as it is in this moment to like think about it and, and figure out where to put it all in your mind, I, I wouldn't put energy into wondering when she made that decision because that's not going to change anything. That's not going to help you it's not going to help you to grow. It's it's going to just be this thing that just kind of rotting away in your mind. And so I think that you have to look at it as a blessing in disguise. And now you have another person that you had this connection with that you proposed to. And so I would just do everything I could to focus my energy in that and recognize that it is love lost and it's painful, but it's like part of growing and finding the person you're meant to be with is experiencing people that you're not meant to be with. Sure. I guess just the follow up to that is like, is that normal? Like you want to figure out every single possible aspect of things in order to feel like you've done a job completely. Is that like normal? It's normal to question those things, but I think it's rare to get answers. You know, yeah. like I was in a relationship in my 20s with somebody who, you know, we said a lot of poisonous things to each other. And and then, you know, you have to you have to step away from that and, and examine like, am I really that person? But it's like, no, we're we're all complicated people. So if you guys said poisonous things to each other, I would try to compartmentalize that if you can. Mm -hmm. But I think focusing right now on your new girlfriend and being really happy. And I was telling Josh earlier that one of my relationships in my early 20s, I was heartbroken when it ended. But 
I realized later as I got older that the relationship was just about me. Like I don't, I don't really, Mm -hmm. because that's just where I was at that point in my life. Even though I, you know, whatever was heartbroken, it was kind of like, well, what's wrong with me? Why doesn't anyone like me? I was just thinking about the idea of like mourning and what that means and if that is important. And in my mind, it's, it's mourning is, is such a, an odd and different process for everybody. So to say that you haven't mourned or given yourself the time to mourn, I don't necessarily think you're being fair to yourself in a certain way because everybody mourns differently. And if right now you're like putting your energy into this new relationship, the idea of mourning is a process that maybe takes more time for you than someone else. Or it's not just like, I'm going to do my mourning and then I'm good. I I think that's like, it's more gray and complicated than that. And so thinking about kind of what we're saying before about about eventually this was a thing that was going to come up in the relationship and end it. If, if this was that big of a difference that she did not, it would not work with what you wanted your life to be. You would have been sacrificing. She would have been sacrificing. And there would have been a lot of unhappiness that was being suppressed. And so I think that the process of mourning is thinking about it logically and rationally over the course of time. And so I think that I wouldn't personally be too worried that like you didn't give yourself the time to mourn because you're, you're doing it now. That's like, this is part of that process, yeah. I think. And and Evan, here's also what I would suggest to you. I would be very wary of talking too much about your ex to your new fiance. Uh If your ex does reach out in any way, I would be very careful and communicative with your fiance about those elements. And and I also think you have to look at this as the death of a relationship. You know, when people die, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. Even if you had a completely rational conversation with your ex, it's an unsolvable puzzle. But what matters, I think, is your future and what you've learned from that relationship Mm -hmm. and refining what you want and figuring out what you can give to your partner. And it sounds like she makes you super happy. It sounds amazing. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, put any pressure on yourself to mourn per se i think it's very natural that we ask questions about like why what crumbled where was it what did i miss yeah like where like you know all those things Mm -hmm. because even if you asked her like i said you know she could be like well you were selfish or whatever her things are but those are vague and they may be only applicable to her so you can't necessarily trust her opinion to form yourself do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it could have been wrong person, wrong timing. And it could have been too, because we were talking earlier about like the idea of relationships and the idea of what you want it to be. It could have been that maybe she had a, a different idea of what she wanted and then realized that she was playing a character as an actor. You understand that. And, you know, like I, I know I've been guilty of that before of like lying to myself and not really knowing what it is I'm doing. I'm just kind of like going into something and not being completely honest. I'm like playing a part in a way there. There's just, there's so many variables and things that like, I think that Anna's saying is you're just not going to get answers to. So I think that the morning process is complicated and long. And, and it sounds to me like you have a really solid head on your shoulders. You're a rational person. You're doing what you want to do and you have an amazing person that is next to you now. So I think like, don't put too much pressure on yourself to like figure it all out and have all the answers and make it all clean and clear. Cause it just, in my experience, it's never worked that way. Mm-hmm. Each of my heartbreaks are very important to me, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and really I wouldn't trade those journeys because they were, they were defining for me, mm-hmm. but Evan, I'm sorry though, that I'm sorry that that happened. I, I could talk to you for a long time because, because I want to talk to you about your new um, love. I think that's really exciting. Yeah. And, you know, when I said try not to mention her, I think in terms of comparison, but I think it's okay if you're yeah. close with her to ask her about her heartbreaks, you know, or um, maybe you guys can have sort of a, a discussion about that and how she got over some things and how, I mean, I don't know if, you know, sometimes people get funny talking about exes uh, in terms of like jealousy and stuff, but, you know, these are important life journeys and I, it might be nice you might get some relief and you get might get to know your fiance even better if if you guys have a discussion yeah yeah i think i think you hit it on the head i think i've been giving myself a lot of shit mm-hmm. for feeling like i i couldn't mourn or grieve in any way but i think like you guys were saying you know putting all of my investment in things like art and musicals and my teaching gig and my new fiance who yes is just the love of my life i could not have been luckier really i think that has been the grieving and mourning process and i think i just needed people to be like you're doing things fine i need to know that this is the right thing oh completely yeah i I tell you right now like i'm someone that i put an extreme pressure on myself to always 
do things the right way and make sure I'm always, you know, doing everything the best way possible. And so I totally get that state of mind. And I think that, that you're absolutely right, that you, you are, you're, you're doing it and you're doing it right. And you're doing it in your way and just keep on that path. Things are going great. You know, and just, just, I bet anything, I bet anything, Evan, I could be totally off the mark with this, but I bet a lot of your close friends and family probably have a degree of relief. Oh, uh, they, they, they very much do. Oh, good. They, well, that. they very much. Do. Good, good. That's well, great. that they, that may be the answer that you need. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Just that, that they saw people around you saw that it wasn't, a, that it wasn't a fit. Yeah. And maybe, you know, you guys made each other feel not great all the time. And that's a big indication too, you know? Sure. Oh, Evan, but I'm happy for you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you get to self-quarantine with your fiance? I do, actually. Ooh. I'm at my parents' house, actually, and we're uh, actually repainting my old childhood bedroom, so it's going to be our little space. So, oh. yeah, we actually get to quarantine, which is great. I actually proposed to her in quarantine. Which is That's great. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, congrats. Thank you. Hey, Evan, thanks so much for calling, and, you know, heartbreak and rejection. I don't know if it was heartbreak at this point. Rejection fucking stings yeah yeah uh and even like as i don't know we're we're well aware of it all three of us as actors Mm -hmm. but it's never easy to get you just can't get used to it when you you know when you've invested time and emotion into things Mm -hmm. but congratulations keep us posted i want to hear wedding details i love wedding drama (laughs) i'll keep you posted if there's any big wedding drama yeah please keep in touch i love talking to you and i love you and i love your fiance and your family what color are you guys painting the room uh we we are painting it kind of like a light like a lighter green we want to bring more light into the room and all that we've been watching a lot of house hunters so really we're just trying to make the curb feel a little bit better and all that kind of thing nice well nice. congratulations again thank you so much guys i really appreciate it yeah. thank you evan bye bye guys do you have a favorite joke favorite joke yeah do you have a joke you could tell us uh yeah i uh, all right so um a, a mushroom walks into a bar and the bartender is like hey hey get out of here get out of here we don't serve your kind and the mushroom goes oh come on i'm a fun guy <laughs> i don't know i don't know that's, that's, that's like good. his dad that's joke great. Just, that's great that's usually that's what we get so we fun. usually get yeah which is the best <laughs> hey josh Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's, it's, it's been a great conversation. Okay, well, send us a picture of a painting if you can. Okay, yeah. We'll put it on our thing. Josh, thanks again. All right. Okay, I'll see you. Bye, Josh. Bye.